is Geek Therapy Radio. What are we waiting for? And now your mental curator, Johnny Hamburger. Man, I should really shave. Welcome to Geek Therapy Radio, Midweek Geek, actually. I'm your mental curator, Johnny Hemberger, and today we're going to talk about space trash. Now, most of us, even if just in passing, have at least heard about space trash or space debris. But to bring you up to speed for the sake of this discussion, space debris, it's hard to say, space debris in brief is all the man-made leftover byproducts of human space exploration still orbiting our planet. According to NASA, the first man-made or object to reach space, sorry, talking is so hard, I'm sick, so my ears are all stuffed up and all I hear is silence in my own voice in my head. You ever know how that happens? It's weird. Um, so according to NASA, the first man-made object to reach space was the American bumper whack. Bumper W-A-C. Whack. Powered by a German V-2 rocket, reaching 244 miles above the Earth. Launched at Cape Canaveral in 1949. Okay, so for those keeping score at home, 1949 is four years after Germany's surrender after World War Two, the V-2 being developed by Warner von Braun's team of German researchers. However, a minimal amount of additional research will reveal the first man-made object in space was the German V-2, technically called the A-4 during wartime in 1942. The A-4 reached a height of 55 miles. Not to get too far off track, but the disparity between the two claims is understandable as the boundary between our atmosphere and outer space is relatively arbitrary. It depends on who you ask, and it fluctuates depending on atmospheric conditions. For example, the Kármán line popularly defines the edge of space uh, 100 kilometers above sea level, simply because Theodore von Kármán knew it was close enough to the fluctuating mathematical definition of space, and 100 is easy number to uh, remember. It actually fluctuates between 85 and 100 kilometers. This means while the A4 could have technically crossed into space in 1942 and very likely did, we have no reason to believe it didn't, the bumper whack definitely did by any measure at 244 miles up. Uh, in aeronautical terms, the definition of outer space has to do with the ability of the atmosphere to provide lift. Eventually, as you leave the atmosphere, only centrifugal forces, only centrifugal force contributes to gaining altitude. So, in layman's terms, going fast enough to counter Earth's gravity without the aid of atmospheric lift. Side note, this is also why airplanes can't fly so high. Eventually, you get so high up that there's not enough air for the wings to hold on to. Uh, a loose but not principally parallel mental comparison would be to understand that a boat can't float without enough water underneath it. Just, that's just a loose general, uh, loose uh, mental image there. Jet engines also need oxygen to combust jet fuel, but... Let's get back on track. So when people say, why can't your a jet airliner fly into space? No atmosphere for the wings to cling to and no oxygen to combust the fuel. Uh, again, let's get back on track. We've been putting crap in space for at least three quarters of a century and it's starting to pile up. Now, the first question the passing listener might ask is, who cares? It's up in space. The ocean garbage is what we need to focus on. Well, that's correct. And before ships could reach other continents, villagers villagers only cared about their own rivers and streams. Only later, much later, did humanity realize the global and societal impact of polluted oceans after hundreds of years of abuse. Granted, not hundreds of years of willfully malicious abuse. Science was not advanced enough at the time to understand the danger of polluting the ocean. But it is now, and we have the advantage of scientific wisdom to stay out in front of polluting mankind's newest ocean before it's too late. If by the time humanity has unlocked the science to explore the stars, what good is it if we can't leave port? We can't afford hindsight to be 2020 when we have the foresight now today. So, what can be done to start reducing our cosmic footprint and not allow current waste to impact future exploration? 
That's what this episode of Midweek Geek is all about. Opening a discussion on possible solutions and theories, or at worst, an additional discussion on the matter in hopes uh, that it can add valuable information to other discussions on the subject. You never know. The solution very well can come from a YouTube comment section posted by a shy soul in a corner of the internet no one noticed before. Maybe you listening to this are sitting in that dark corner. If that is you, I need you to know, despite any bullying or lost faith in humanity, your voice matters and can very well change the course of history. So don't be afraid. You're worth listening to. You really are. Please know that. Engrave the fact of your worthiness into the core of your heart. So, I'll start things off by offering my idea. It may be completely impractical. It may not work in the initial incarnation of my offering. In other words, my beta 0.1 version might not hold much current value, but may be built upon by your input and become something viable. That being said, my very basic, simple, initial idea is to start putting neodymium magnets into orbit. Probably big ol' N55 rated 10 pounders, or more, or less, whatever works best, and we don't have to launch them up there exclusively with conventional rockets. We can hurl them up there maybe with a railgun or something other, or by some other ballistic means. Once it's up there, it begins to accumulate mass by attaching to various magnetic debris. In addition to magnetism, Although slight, it would technically have gravity, gravity that would mathematically increase as the glob grows in mass. As it grows in mass, eventually its orbit decreases enough to re-enter the atmosphere and burn up. Of course, this is just theoretical. I'm counting on any of you more well-versed in physics and mathematics than I to either confirm or correct my very basic 0.1 version theory. Uh, Part of me wonders, okay... The magnet is in orbit. What if it gets damaged by other high velocity degree, uh, high velocity debris? As my mind ponders and wanders, a beautiful practice I'd recommend to any of you, by the way, I wonder about the need for protecting the magnet. Maybe put it inside a protective shield. Then I consider the weight this would add and whether or not it's necessarily a bad thing for one big magnet to shatter into smaller magnets flying off in all directions, like a street sweeper exploding into a hundred Roombas, basically. Part of the resulting debris field would be deflected into the atmospheric reentry anyways, potentially speeding up the cleaning process, potentially and theoretically. Uh, Further along in my ponderings, I wonder if this is a viable plan in the scope of timeline. If it takes decades for this method to work, what's the point? Then I think it could work just fine, since we're so far ahead of the issue that decades in the grand scheme of things is the blink of an eye. My main point being that our path to the stars is clear of debris by the time we have the technology to make the voyage in the first place. In this case, the fact that it could take centuries could be inconsequential. The point is, we don't go centuries into the future and then be stifled by our inaction in the past. As I wrap up here, Joe Bond, our digital program director, stepped in a minute ago and we got to talking about this episode. He offered up the -the off-the-cuff idea of sending nukes up there to blast or vaporize the trash. Well, needless to say, that welcomes a litany of counter-considerations or theoretical tweaking, but the fun of all of this is that any alternative counterpoints and discussion is up to you. You might have a better idea. It doesn't matter what walk of life you come from. You may be a cat linguist and have never thought so critically about outer space, let alone, let alone cleaning space trash. But maybe you've noticed how kitty litter clumps to peeps and poops. Even if your idea is to fire Fifi's turds into orbit to stick to micromaterial and It's still a welcomed idea, because while cat turds might not be used in the end, it could spark someone else to come up with a more viable turd alternative. Get it? Alternative? Okay, I think that's a good place to uh, end it. Thank you so much for joining me this week. If you had fun, please subscribe. I can't talk. I'm so sick. I hear my own voice in my head too much. Thank you so much for joining me this week. If you had fun, please consider subscribing and sharing the love. 
All are welcome to enjoy Geek Therapy Radio each week, and there's something for everyone. Just subscribe to the podcast and peruse the episode titles. There's good stuff in there. The podcast is available everywhere, but especially on the iHeartRadio app, Spreaker, iTunes, Pocket Cast, Google Podcast, or you can even ask, Alexa, play the Geek Therapy Radio podcast, to which she'll reply, getting the latest episode of Geek Therapy Radio with Johnny Hamburger from iHeartRadio. She's so cool like that. If you're watching this on YouTube, don't be a stranger. Slap that to dis- <laughs> slap the describe button. No, slap that subscribe button and inter- interact with me on the channel. Uh, no matter what you do, whether you subscribe to the podcast, the YouTube channel, or listen on KPRC 950 AM Saturday nights here in Houston, it is critical that you know that you are loved and worthy. And that no matter where you're coming from, you are capable of truly great things, and it all starts by stimulating your mind. So, find a hobby, learn new things, and explore this incredible universe. If I can somehow inspire that in even one person who listens to Geek Therapy Radio, I'll have made my mark, and I will be overjoyed. So until next week, take care, my geeks. Don't be afraid to explore and be good to others, including yourself. Okay, as usual, at the end of Midweek Geek, I'm doing a 60-second here for Audi Central Houston. The new Q8s are coming for the first time ever, the new 2019 Q8s, and they are unimaginably cool. They are just the coolest SUVs on the road, and that is like a precursor for the new e-tron that's coming out next year as well. The e-tron, by the way, doesn't burn any gas at all, so make sure you are going to AudiCentralHouston.com to get caught up on the st- on all this stuff. Go visit Audi Central Houston in person anyways, just to peruse the floor. It's like going to an art gallery of technology and performance and safety, and just the, the way they bend the sheet metal is amazing. At Audi Central Houston, that's where you can get all the Audis in every budget, A3 to the R8 or the Q8 there in between there. Audi Central Houston has you covered on all fronts in any budget. So visit AudiCentralHouston.com right now to start perusing before you go visit my friend Danny Posey, the general manager at Audi Central Houston, and tell him that Geek Therapy Radio sent you.